Hi, this is Dr. Emily Scherning with AR, and I'd like to say hello to all of our friends in New Mexico. This state level forecast builds on what I shared in my 2050 forecast for the Southwest, which is looking pretty challenging. Some parts of New Mexico are looking at a rough ride. I'm gonna be honest with you, but there's a lot of regional variation across the state. So let's dig right in. We're gonna talk about heat, water, and power in your state. And we're gonna get some info on Albuquerque, Taos, Roswell, Angel Fire, and Red River. So if you wrote to me about New Mexico, I've got your info here. Let's start out by looking at what's happened in the past. Just a second, I'm gonna show you a map here. So this map shows historical temperature data across the Southwest, which you can see over the last 120 years, there has been a notable increase in temperature in the Southwest. But the state of New Mexico has really had a milder change than other states. It hasn't been blasted with heat in the way that Colorado or California has been. Unfortunately, that trend is not likely to continue. Let's look at projected heat which if we look down here, this map shows a change in the number of days above 90 degrees. So if you've got yellow, it means, you know, maybe another week of warm days in the summer. But as you get towards the dark red, you're talking about more like two months. And unfortunately, you can see that there are some areas in New Mexico that are looking at a really dramatic heat up. It does look like Santa Fe might be high enough up in elevation to escape the worst of the heat, but these longer summers do look likely to impact Albuquerque in a pretty significant way. I had folks write in asking about Taos, Angel Fire, and Red River. You can see that those places are in that area up by the Colorado border where we do have less change projected. My friends in Roswell, I'm afraid that you're looking at a big warm season increase by 2050, maybe another month and a half of extreme heat. Let's look at how that's going to impact agricultural zones. So if we go here, we see a map with historical agricultural zones and projected changes. And before you look too hard, let's remember that this is looking at a high emissions scenario a little further out in the future than we're interested for America 2050. So we're going to want to dial this projection back a bit, but you can still see that there are pretty dramatic changes that we're looking at in New Mexico. New Mexico historically sees a hard freeze across most of the state, and we're looking at losing a fair amount of that, although there is good conservation towards the northern border. In much of the state, though, we're looking at losing a real freeze in the winters, that hard chill, and that's going to have a big impact on your plant communities. You're looking at two agricultural zones shift for a fair amount of the state, and we know that when there are changes impacting plants, that's going to impact water. We all know plants need water and that as it gets warmer, plants need more water. So this temperature information, it gives us a crucial perspective as we look at water in New Mexico. We know that water shortages are a big problem in the outlook for the Southwest. And that's true for New Mexico as well, but with a twist. New Mexico has a really different water profile than the other Southwestern states. It gets so much more of its water from groundwater than the other Southwestern states. 87% of the domestic water in New Mexico comes from groundwater. And we know that groundwater le levels are dropping in the Southwest as a general rule. In New Mexico, we've got three big water areas to talk about. The upper Colorado basin, which you can learn more about the relatively mild forecast around continued surface water availability in that area in last week's Colorado forecast. We've got the Gila River basin, which is on the border with Arizona. And for most of the state, we've got the Rio Grande aquifer. I feel like I should point out that the Rio Grande has huge water demands in the US and in Mexico, both related to surface water and groundwater. And let's take just a second. I wanna show you a picture of this aquifer and you'll see that it's not very good. It's not centered on New Mexico. And I looked for a long time, but I couldn't find a great like all aquifer picture for New Mexico. So this red is the Rio Grande aquifer. This area right here, is your Gila River aquifer. And up here, you've got your upper Colorado basin. So if you can just envision it with me, maybe that'll help you figure out where you are in relation to this detailed water forecast. And you can see that most of your population in New Mexico is dependent on the Rio Grande. A lot of concern on the strain on all three of those major water systems comes more from agricultural use than domestic use. Many farmers right now, they use a flex system for their agricultural water, and that's particularly true, I should note, in the Gila River Basin. 
Farmers, they shift to pumping groundwater when the surface water supplies are reduced. It's expensive to pump the groundwater, but it would cost more not to get a crop out at all. And, you know, the farmers are acting in reasonable business interests. But as we get a point where the groundwater is decreasing and the surface water is decreasing, it seems like you could get to a point where there's not a lot of give left in the system. But I don't want to paint a hopeless picture here. It wouldn't be accurate. And it assumes people won't change how they use water. The people of New Mexico have made huge changes to their domestic water use. And the aquifer under Albuquerque, for example, is rebounding. There's a fabulous 2019 report from the US Geological Survey that shows that the aquifer is healing because of the choices people are making. In New Mexico, you're far enough on the edge of the northern side of that Rio Grande aquifer that with conservative water choices, both domestically, agriculturally, and industrially, we could see sustainable use of the groundwater. In the upper Colorado basin, there's continued hope for sustainable use of surface water. And the more we can use that surface water and let the groundwater recharge, the more we're gonna have the groundwater in there when we really need it. That's how Albuquerque is doing it. They've got careful, responsible use of surface water and it's recharging the aquifers. New Mexico really does have potential for sustainable domestic water use. And it's because of the way the people of the state have already really begun to value water. Keep it up, it's making a huge difference already. Talking about trends that are challenging, but maybe not so scary for New Mexico as for other parts of the Southwest, let's talk about power. Just a second, we got another map to pull up here. There we go, where we're gonna look at um, energy outlook for the Southwest. There's a lot of power generation infrastructure that's at risk of decreased productivity as we move towards 2050, in large part because as it gets warmer, the stations operate less efficiently. You can see that in New Mexico, there's really not as big a problem locally as for other states. When we look at these sort of tan colored circles, we're talking about maybe a negative uh, 10%. 10% decrease in your power generation. So you need a tune up in New Mexico, but it's not as urgent a situation as you can see in Colorado or California. We know that all of these grids are connected here. So it's not like you can get complacent in New Mexico, but it's always nice when the local infrastructure isn't your biggest problem, right? And there's some really cool energy stuff going on in New Mexico. Those drops in generating efficiency, you know, like we said, they're related to the increased heat and the need for cooling. And New Mexico is innovating in that. If we look at the Afton generating station in New Mexico, that's a natural gas combined cycle plant and it uses hybrid cooling. And the plant has a 60% reduction in its intensity of water use compared to conventionally cooled plants. In an area where water is the big limiter, that's a huge deal. New Mexico also has energy policies in place that should help with getting ready for 2050. Policies promoting modern energy sources and decoupling energy company profits from the electricity sold. That'll help so you don't get into a situation like our friends in Texas did last winter with a profit facing utility structure resulting in little kids freezing to death. We can't forget about that. We can't import, forget about the importance of some ethics in our utility companies. In New Mexico, we've got a framework with some ethics and some really positive technological innovation. So let's wrap this up. New Mexico, up in the north, things are looking pretty good. Changes are mild enough. You should be looking at a lot of conservation potential for familiar landscapes and species through 2050. When you look at much of the southern and central parts of the state, though, you're looking at big shifts. You're losing the freeze, and you're looking at potentially transformational change by 2050. Very serious challenges there. New Mexico is facing some challenges with water and power, but the state has already produced some of its own reasons for hope, some real parts of the solution to these problems. So on the whole, your outlook for the state is very dependent on where you are. If you're in one of the areas projected to heat up, and that is a lot of the state by area, you better take some time to get ready for what's coming. You got time to make plans. This is Dr. Scherning with AR signing out. Please like and subscribe. Help get the message out there. There is hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.